Hi, uh, welcome uh, to the latest Critical Conversation. Uh, today we're with uh, Roger Green at uh, Metropolitan State University uh, in Denver, uh, who is a uh, professor of uh, English and uh, English literature uh, and rhetoric at uh, Metropolitan State. Um, there's a very interesting topic we want to explore, something that's very, of course, personally relevant to me, uh, the 1960s and the persistence of psychedelic culture. Um, and uh, I know he's going to have a lot to say, and there's a lot of angles we can explore. I, uh, Full disclosure, I was uh, his outside chair uh, and reader for his doctoral dissertation on, on this topic. So uh, that's sort of how I got to know him, um, even though he had taken a course or two from me as a graduate student, uh, and became fascinated with his particular take on the topic. So I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself um, and um, say a little bit about how he got interested in and what his kind of method or uh, approach has been and what it what it continues to mean and why, why you should be interested in it other than as just kind of uh, romantic fixation or sort of uh, curiosity shop fascination. So go ahead, Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thanks, Carl. Um, I think the project uh, really started uh, back with when I was working on my master's degree. Um, I, I, or I did an interdisciplinary master's program in the humanities um, and had to approach a project from three different angles. Uh, I uh, was reading a lot of continental philosophy at the time and became enamored with Emmanuel Levinas's ethical philosophy. And I was studying music, I'm a musician as well, um, studying jazz music and uh, weirdly saw these uh, uh, huge connections um, to me between what Levinas was talking about and uh, what the avant-gardists um, in the jazz community were talking about around the same time, the late 50s, early 60s, um, particularly people like Ornette Coleman, who just passed a few weeks ago. Uh, um, uh, so it's philosophy, literature, and music, and then so it's kind of established this this interest in the mid 20th century for me, um, but um, where I looked at kind of American culture, but also through a continental philosophical lens. Uh, then when I went to get my first PhD at um, DU in the English department in rhetoric and theory, um, uh, that all sort of came back around um, as I've, I've always been interested in. Um, as ways that people try to uh, code infinite or ecstatic experience aesthetically. Um, 20th century philosophy is particularly good for this after Heidegger. And so, so, uh, so for those of you who know anything about 20th century philosophy, there's a kind of debate between Heidegger and Immanuel Kant um, that's really famous in the 1920s. Um, where uh, Heidegger kind of challenges a subject-object relationship that had been really dominant in aesthetics uh, uh, up until that time. So it was really about kind of using this continental philosoph philosophical way to talk about uh, psychedelic experiences in the 60s um, uh, where people really we're having these kinds of experiences that, that collapse subjectivity and objectivity. That, um, uh, so uh, I was that that was kind of the end of my uh, my career as a, for my PhD in English. Um, uh, doesn't sound like a literature degree, but uh, uh, um, I was particularly interested in that aesthetic notion of tra tra trying to code this kind of thing of type called transcendence, uh, um, looking at literary uh, examples of that, and then thinking about um, this much more recent discussion called political theology. So the, the project really was called Beware of Mad John, Psychedelic Aesthetics, Political Theology, and Literature. I focus mostly on literature there, and now a couple of years out, um, I've been teaching literature, like Carl said, at uh, Metro State and uh, a lot of rhetoric. Um, and as I've gone and 
you know, the conferences, I find myself writing on more and more esoteric things, shamanism, uh, uh, primitivism um, from the late uh, 19th century on. And so as that's expanded, I've decided to return to DU to get another PhD in religious studies and theology to sort of help me fill in the gaps on this much larger project. Okay, well, well listen, let's, uh, since I, I am familiar with your dissertation, and I know you're probably going to be publishing at least portions of it eventually down the line, uh, you talk a lot about uh, Huxley, and Huxley, of course, was the one who, uh, you know, discovered uh, LSD, uh, uh, you know, along with uh, Richard Alpert, uh, who became Baba Ramdas. Uh, who I actually heard speak uh, back in the uh, early uh, 1970s. And, uh, and uh, these were kind of the figures, you might call them, these were the uh, theoreticians of ecstasy, which in many ways kind of uh, defines the 60s counterculture. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned bringing it up today, and you talked about political theology, which is a, you know, a, a very live issue right now in some in some ways is becoming the kind of overwhelming uh, motif in uh, theor uh, interdisciplinary theoretical discussions uh, because we have obviously uh, a lot of political challenges in the world. I suppose it would be shameless to get in a plug for my own book uh, called Force of God, Political Theology and the Crisis of Liberal Democracy, which is coming out with... Uh, Columbia University Press uh, in about a month, actually, uh, and you can you can find an order if you're interested online. But anyway, I, I, but that that's just part of the conversation. It's really looking at the world crisis in which we're living in terms of a whole set of questions we've never had before. And if there's one thing I think we could say in retrospect about the '60s uh, is that it was also a time where but there was a sense of crisis where the whole order was coming apart, you know, burn, baby, burn, uh, you know, bring the system down. Uh, this kind of apocalyptic mood that you can hear in the music of the times, uh, you know, particularly uh, the, the Beatles in the late 60s, the Sgt. Pepper album is something that comes to mind. Uh, the, uh, the politics, uh, you know the uh, the songs the songs of Dylan, even the the psychedelic art uh, that uh, Primary uses its medium uh, posters uh, in uh, the uh, Haight Ashbury during that period and so forth. The the virulent anti-war protests, but also the kind of frustration with the political process uh, itself that led to this kind of deep across the board quest for spirituality. Uh, in this search for some kind of deeper, profound, to use the terminology of the time, cosmic meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, even though uh, drugs, uh, you know, as the kind of avenue for that experience, you know, eventually kind of lost their luster, uh, other than, you know, just as a way of getting high, uh, which is still with us today. Uh, but LSD was, was in, in, in some ways, or or the, or the psychedelic revolution, which, you know, and I was at the epicenter of that in the San Francisco area in the 60, late 60s, uh, especially in uh, summer of 1967, the summer of love. Now, I, I remember uh, that, that was, those experiences, you know, were just overwhelming, that every everything seemed to have a meaning that went well beyond the, the quotidian or the everyday, you know, even uh, political protests and a sense that there's a need for social change. One of the preoccupations of progressives this time of memorial now became uh, one of the total, a total liberation of the human mind and spirit and so forth. Uh, and uh, LSD was seen as being in, in not so much a drug of choice, but in, but in some ways, uh, a well, to use uh, Huxley's own ter own term, something that cl that cleansed the doors of perception, taking taking that phraseology, of course, from William Blake. So, uh, as, so as someone who I know you you weren't born during that era, uh, when you look back on it, I know there's a kind of fascination with 
uh, the millennial generation in, uh, with the 60s. When you look back upon that area, what kind of, what, what did you see the role of psychedelics? You said it was the search for ecstasy. But why is ecstasy so important now? Um, uh, so ecstasy in terms of ecstatic experience, not Molly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, although that might be popular for other reasons. Uh, um, I think for me, as a, 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 let me speak for me as someone who's not of the 60s generation first, and then speak to why I think culturally right now the 60s are important. Um, so for me, I grew up in a very, uh, I, I have very square parents um, who are uh, my, my dad was born in 37, my mom was born in 41. My dad had been in the military um, before people were being shipped off to Vietnam, and because of the family situation, he didn't, didn't end up being re-enlisted. He'd already served, uh, and his brothers um, had served in uh, Korea. So it was a very square... Um, uh, traditional kind of upbringing for me. I have nine brothers, or uh, well, I have nine siblings so in my family, so six brothers and two sisters. And, uh, you know, we had crew cuts, and, and my, my girlfriends uh, early on um, would say, oh, it's like you were raised in the 1950s. And I think that to, to a certain extent, even though I was born in 77, we had a very... My parents did not go through the 60s that is re... Um, capitulated in media. They weren't hippies. They weren't doing drugs. They didn't drink. My dad was an airline mechanic. So um, I became fascinated with the music of that era probably first and um, also with the ways that I was sort of growing up and rebelling against my own parents and uh, uh, in normal ways, not really excessive ways. I, um, I felt a lot of uh, connection, I think, to to uh, the representation, uh, particularly the, the ethical um, peace aspects of the peace movement um, were really important to me, but I was really figuring that out in the kind of 60s revival that happened in the early 90s. And if you went through the 90s, you saw beat, Car beat um, generation folks like Jack Kerouac showing up in Gap commercials all of a sudden. Uh, um, there's a, a really great book by Thomas Frank called The Conquest of Cool that came out in the late 90s that talked about the resurgence of 60s marketing culture um, and how that, that shaped later culture, um, sort of materialistic history. As in terms of the 21st century, I think for younger folks being fascinated in the 1960s, I think particularly with psychedelics, um, not just LSD, what we've seen in psychedelic research is, um, uh, first of all, the psychedelic research went away for a long time because of Timothy Leary, um, largely. <laughs> um, uh, not, I don't want to blame Leary as much as uh, some people might want to. Uh, I think that he became a media um, presence partly to try and escape his own prison sentence, and uh, I don't want to... Uh, so he got more and more radical the more and more he was trying to keep himself out of prison and break out of prison. Uh, uh, but he did real damage to the research of psychedelics, and you couldn't do it. Um, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, uh, people like Rick Strassman in uh, New Mexico uh, finally got the go ahead to do uh, psychedelic research on human subjects who knew that they were being tested on, not like the CIA, um, earlier in the century. Uh, and, and what you see in the really good literature review of this is in Nicholas Longlitz's book Neuropsychedelia, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so he documents that if, if I'm glossing over this for people. Uh, uh, what you saw is in order to do psychedelic research, you have to be really um, hard science driven, um, especially early on. You wouldn't have gotten approval if you wanted to do research on spirituality. Um, even though a lot of people in the 60s, I think, were doing that individually and in group settings. Um, uh, but what the findings have shown sort of consistently since the mid-90s, 
um, and Longlitz's book is a really good example of this, is that even in the most hard science settings, labs, with people who've never had any experience with drugs before, with very objective, atheistic um, scientists, uh, the question of spirituality comes up over and over again. It becomes central to the discussion of uh, psychedelics. And this was an initial, there's a really famous test at Harvard, the Good Friday test, that um, uh, a grad student of uh, Richard Alpert and uh, Timothy Leary put on um, Walter Ponky. And uh, uh, in their initial findings, uh, that uh, people were given LSD, um, some people at, on a good, at a Good Friday ceremony, um, uh, theological students were given, uh, some were given LSD, some were given placebos, and the people who took, who took, it wasn't LSD, sorry, it was psilocybin for that test. Uh, um, they were given psychedelics, and uh, the ones who were given it um, claimed that they had more mystical experiences on the whole than the people who were given placebos, although a couple of people, people who took placebos felt like they had a transcendent or spiritual experience um, on Good Friday. Um, so we went through this kind of a spiritual discussion um, in order to pass a kind of positivistic rhetoric that allowed psychedelic research to be done again, and yet the question of spirituality um, never goes away. In fact, it's more alive now than ever. Um, if I could get back to a statement you made earlier, and it's perhaps the track uh, that we might want to really explore, uh, because, I mean, there, there's a lot that's been written about the history of the 60s, and of course, there's even a, a famous book about the LSD and the CIA and how that was in some ways uh, secretly sprung on American culture, primarily as a kind of covert action to uh, to, to tamp down uh, political protests, or at least that's what the claims are. That I'm talking about the book Acid Dreams, which is goes into fascinating detail, and I've actually used it in my freshman seminar on the 60s to have them read that. And, and so forth, and you know, to see the way in which, what well, get them get people to look at the way in which things don't seem to be the way they are, and so forth. Uh, but also, there was always that what you might call that ecstatic notion of politics back then too. It was, uh, if we can, if we can say uh, anything about the pol the radical politics of the '60s, it was dominated by a nebulous movement known as the New Left. Uh, and the new left was, uh, you know, in many ways, heirs of the orthodox uh, leftists who were primarily Stalinists and communists. Uh, I mean, it was impossible to be anything else because you would have been purged. Uh, you know, you were either a, you were either a liberal or a communist, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, the there became this dissatisfaction with the kind of regimentation and even what we might call this sort of fixation on, on the labor movement uh, and the white working class. Uh, it, was, it was, there was all, the, the period coincided with this sort of, you know, intensification of the civil rights movement and the rise of the, uh, of the Black Panthers uh, in this, whole notion of black radicalism that reshaped the whole kind of landscape that took us beyond the legacy of uh, Martin Luther King and so forth. So there was this idea that politics was not just about the achievement of objectives, nor was it about even following a kind of orthodox party line, which was considered to be anathema, but it was in, in some ways it was about, you know, the, the total transformation of what it meant to be human in some ways. Politics as being this kind of form of expressive uh, ecstasy. And you know, it's why you get, like in France, uh, coincided, you get very interesting books like uh, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, 
uh, a thousand plateaus and Annie Oedipus and so forth, which are both, you know, testimonies to altered states of consciousness, uh, and um, you know, as well as kind of, you know, very radical. Uh, political statements. Uh, it's been claimed that actually they were using LSD when they wrote that book. I'm not sure if that's true, but a very famous uh, French philosopher has made that uh, has made that claim. So you could call this transcendental politics. Now moving up to the present, um, I'm I'm uh, in, in in a sense given the kind of new political sensibility, but it's quite different from the '60s in some ways. I think. Somebody who's lived through both eras, it's a lot less sophisticated in the 60s. It's more, it's much more sort of armchair. Uh, I mean, you don't, you don't see people out in the street getting their heads bashed in except in the Middle East, but you don't see that uh, in, in America the way you did in the 60s. So it becomes more kind of, it becomes more uh, Twitter politics and this kind of experience of, what we might call signifying ecstasy as opposed to a sense that there's really history of the making and uh, so forth. You know, we get, we, you get your political highs like the Supreme Court decision that many people had this, uh, this past week and so forth. But, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the same thing as, you know, watching the RTC building burn like you did in the 1960s and so forth. So I, I'm, my question is, and this is more a speculative question, and we can sort of deal with the present now rather than the past, is what what does psychedelic politics or this kind of transcendental spirituality, maybe we could even use the term political spirituality because, uh, you know, that a lot of the Michel Foucault scholars, and I realize Foucault is also being criticized right now as being a, a closet neoliberal, uh, but many of the uh, have written about Foucault and his own political spirituality uh, and how in, in, in some ways spirituality in that sense was, is the only possible real politics. I know that was the kind of attitude of a lot of radicals in the late 60s. That's why people like uh, Jerry Rubin, um, uh, um, uh, what was Jane Fonda's husband? I can't remember, remember his name right now and so forth. All of them became, uh, in, in some ways, uh, they, they became, uh, you know, quasi-New Agers. And the New Age movement itself, you know, called itself a movement. It used the very terminology of uh, the politics of that particular period. So what what do you see happening now today? And what, what can we take from this historical repository and apply it to the day? Okay, um, I'll, I'll refer to a few specific books here. Actually, your book, um, The Interruption of Eternity, which is a great um, 1980s critique of the New Age movement as it had sort of moved out of the 1960s. And um, uh, Actually, the uh, book was written in the 70s. But, uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, um, so there's The Interruption of Eternity, and then... Uh, um, in the early 90s, Francis Fukuyama's um, famous essay, The End of History, and the book that came out just after that, um, there uh, was this sense that at the end of the Cold War, um, that somehow the end of history happened. Um, in your book, Carl, you refer to um, a kind of loss of historical sense um, with the new movement that. Uh, that, that, that was really disturbing to you at the time uh, because uh, the force of history just became this kind of amorphous uh, thing that, that um, lost the kind of momentum that you had seen going on. Now, Fukuyama um, had a different sort of idea in the late, um, um, sorry, late 80s, early 90s um, that there was, that after the sort of uh, dialectical situation between the West and the Soviet Union um, broke down uh, that that was in, announcing some sort of end of history um, yeah. in a much more in a much more low key but concrete sense I feel like younger people today my students for sure don't have a really wide or strong sense of history um, they're not invested in an idea of history and so to that extent, Fukuyama, some of the things Fukuyama has said um, might 
ring out. Um, there is, to continue with the, the present, um, there's a, a sense that politics isn't necessarily transcendence. There's this idea that theory and transcendence can't happen at all. So there's a, a kind of imminent politics that is really, um, you know, updated in radicalized books like the Coming Insurrection, which was a book that came out a few years ago in France, and the uh, uh, writers of the book, the Tarnak Nine, were charged with pre-terrorism uh, for publishing the book. When if you read the book, it's like sometimes it feels like punk rock, like like angsty teenage stuff, and sometimes it's a recapitulation of Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. Uh, I told, I very much agree that whatever is happening politically, whether it's Occupy, whether it's the coming insurrection, whatever is happening now is not at all a good... No one now is trying to levitate the Pentagon. <laughs> it's, um, it's a very good trope, exactly. Something in the 60s allowed that to happen, and when we talk about historically, a lot of times we have to separate the psychedelic movement from the um, civil rights movement, which is a, a hard thing to do. Um, I see why the, psych the psychedelic movement wanted to depoliticize itself in, in certain ways, but really the, the whole the personal is political uh, mantra of the 60s um, uh, <laughs> underlies the the fact that like you can't divorce everything really neatly. Um, uh, the psychedelic movement did, for me, and why I look back to it in the 1960s, for um, it redrew the possibility of liberal citizenship. For me, so we see liberal uh, civil rights. Wait a minute, say, explain that. Say say more about that. Okay. What do you mean possibility? Of liberal citizenship. Okay, so the foundation of liberalism, um, if we're going to go back to people like Spinoza or perhaps earlier than even to Machiavelli, um, we could debate that. <laughs> uh, but the idea that um, an individual has rights um, as a citizen um, historically, in that um, uh, the there are some rights are inalienable and some rights are duty driven, and that's a long historical conversation that we could have. So liberalism, when I'm talking about liberalism here, I'm talking about in the broadest political economic sense of the word. I'm not talking about Democrats or conservatives. Um, uh, the liberal project of citizenship uh, in the 1960s, we were faced with the idea that. Uh, post-industrialization was going to create um, a situation where we don't have to work all the time. We don't have to work 40 hours a week. Um, this is where the human potential movement and the people like at, at, at Esalen in California... Yeah, that actually goes back to the end of the 19th century, the Fabian Socialists. Uh, uh, the, you know, people like Bernard Shaw were the first to articulate that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if we, if we did a parallel with the civil rights movement, what you see are a lot of marginalized groups seeking seated citizenship status in the same way that we saw last week with the gay marriage thing, right? For people who are working in LGBTQ um, forms of activism, that wasn't necessarily the main agenda. They've got a lot more, that, that was a very conservative decision. Um, for, for many people, but to the American public as a sort of uh, a mediatized sort of uh, yeah. concept, it was a big breakthrough. Um, so the people who are doing psychedelics in the 60s challenged, um, they were seeking to expand what citizenship could be at the same time that the civil rights uh, movement was trying to insulate a kind of protected citizenship for marginalized people. And so you always see that kind of dialectic. When we see a crisis in liberalism, particularly after 9-11 in the past 15 years, you see an ongoing movement, especially within the academy, I think, um, to 
keep including, including marginalized voices. And at the same time, you see a situation with ISIS or global terror, um, and whether or not, you know, however you want to buy into what, whatever that discussion is, um, there's a sense that liberalism has been an economic crisis, housing crisis in 2008 that we are maybe recovering from now five years later, or I guess it's seven years later now. Um, uh, with that is the, the, again, this question of the possibility of what liberal citizenship, what is, what does it mean to have liberal, liberal citizenship? Um, are you going to be really, really extreme and say that the idea of liberal citizenship itself is conservative, outmoded, um, unethical? Um, is there something inherently violent um, in the individual focus of liberalism, for example, that makes uh, um, liberal society destructive to the rest of the world? This is like combining it with global capitalism or what sometimes people call late capitalism. Uh, and so in that situation, you see psychedelics um, continuing to have the potential to redefine liberal citizenship, but the discussion has changed, right? The discussion is like, well, what, like what has happened with marijuana in Colorado, for example, where you use a positivistic rhetoric to get something legalized and legitimately medicalized, right? Like, like somehow, like, the med if, it's, if it's medical, it's legitimate, right? Like Foucault, rings of Foucault here. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and then that becoming recreationalized, right? We, we will see this with, with this with psychedelics broadly in the next in decade for sure, I, I believe. And uh, so that's my prediction. Um, but what I think is really at stake is the idea of, of um, a kind of subjectivity as opposed to citizenship. Um, we know that on psychedelics that there's this collapse between subjectivity and objectivity. And if, that, if we're expanded beyond what we are as individuals, in a psychedelic experience, and then returned back into a state. And that's what people forget about psychedelics, is that the psychedelic experience goes out, and it's a return, because there's re-entry, is what we call it, in the, or what Leary and Albert and um, Metzner call it in the, their book, The Psychedelic Experience. The question isn't, like, are we going to allow it? Are we all going to be tripping out? Um, are we going to legalize it medically? The question since the 60s and now is, what do you do with the information gained on the trip? And certain, certainly only it's a privileged thing to be able to take the trip, right? That's like, it's almost like liberal cultures allow this ability to explore the philosophical nuances of wow, what else could be out there, and what can I do with it as an individual person? So it sets a sort of platform for that, um, but it doesn't set the, it's not the end of the discussion. So the 21st century discussion is whether or not liberalism is an outmoded idea, and psychedelics are, continue to be a way to talk about that for me. But, but I also hear you saying, you know, following that particular logic, and, you know, you, you, you talk about the kind of the, the expansion and inclusion as being the kind of political momentum of the last 50 years. And, of course, uh, you know, it was always there. Uh, but, you know, the 60s was really the only time in American history where you might say it had its own internal dynamic. You know, the, uh, the inclusion of rights for African Americans, uh, you know, was the consequence of the Civil War. And, you know, anybody who studied the history of the Civil War realized it was as much a sectional conflict. It wasn't really about a, a certain group of people in the North who had this, 
you know, I mean, you did have the abolitionists, and a lot of this was driven by a kind of sense of the moral religious contradiction of slavery. But for the most part, you know, it was a sectional conflict, and uh, slavery was seen uh, as being, you know, in some ways the evil, the moral evil manifested uh, in uh, that conflict. You know, I mean, if it, it we say it was the cause of the Civil War, but historians will tell you, well, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't come to 1863. Uh, the South uh, succeeded because it was afraid uh, that Lincoln, you know, was going to uh, abolish slavery. But, you know, he hadn't made moves in that direction, you know, officially yet and so forth. So, and, and the way that we treated blacks in the North after the Civil War, you know, tells us there wasn't really any expansion of the sense of citizenship or Jim, or Jim Crow wouldn't have happened. But in the 60s, in, uh, in, the, in some ways, the civil rights movement was that kind of uh, hallmark event. It was the inauguration because it really was about a radical whole new idea of citizenship that even though it was, you know, it, there was a legal foundation for it, hadn't really entered into the structure of subjectivity of the American consciousness. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, particularly uh, because of LSD, uh, this, this whole notion of subjectivity becomes much broader. I mean, you get between 1967 and 69, you know, the beginning of, you know, ra uh, political feminism, the so-called women's liberation movement, you know, this, this took the whole notion of emancipation, you know, from Marxist rhetoric and, and in a sense, you know, began to apply it to different groups who had obviously have been excluded, but the importance of their exclusion hadn't been taken all that seriously for, and this and this has kept going. I mean, 1970 with the Stonewall riots, which you know the uh, LBGT uh, movement marks is its uh, you know uh, kind of uh, you know John Brown's raid, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so you know we, I wonder to what degree this sort of new consciousness, as it was called, and that was the term, consciousness raising new consciousness. All that came into being, even though it was a term uh, from uh, from Marxist discipline and Marxist uh, uh, collective practice. It was a, it was it was really became popular because of uh, the you know what was called the mystic crystal revelations that LSD had provided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so I'm wondering, you know, in, in some ways, if this isn't uh, a way, in a sense, of fortifying the citizenship discussion. Now, at the same time, you know, when it when a right simply becomes, you know, a form of pleasure or a form of, and it becomes also a kind of consumerism, you know, which we're seeing in Colorado with marijuana already. I mean, it's, it's following every model of, you know, cons consumerist marketing and, uh, you know, brand preference and, and so forth. Uh, you know, the same, same thing happens you know, even the ideas has been a lot written about this, uh, and so forth. But I wonder if you know, following your logic and to get back to the underlying theme of political theology, if ultimately this isn't really all about citizenship, you know, because you, you don't have this. You, you mentioned ISIS, you know, you, you've what's mm -hmm. ISIS is a kind of toxic byproduct of the Arab Spring. And everybody says, yeah, it's all because we invaded Iraq. That's true. In, in a certain sense, but it's mostly about the Arab Spring. You know, it's about the inability, you know, after the secular revolutions of that, of 2011, uh, for Islamic culture to basically say, all right, what, how do, how do we, how do we take the Quran? How do we take Sharia? How do we take all these kind of heritages, which have, you know, which become a form of kind of revolutionary protest in their own right against the perceived evils of colonialism and so forth. And, you know, that's not about citizenship. That's about, you know, uh, you know, wars of, you know, collective wars of liberation, cultural wars of liberation against the West and so forth. A different idea of citizenship. It's certainly not about uh, subjectivity, but yet in the West, we keep, forging on despite all these kind of pushback that's going on in the world. And, you know, we see the opposite happening culturally, not the expansion of rights, uh, but the, but the sort of, uh, 
you know, shrinking of rights all in the name of forming of, of collective cultural ethnic identities and so forth. Uh, but if you do have a strong uh, liberal culture, you know, in, in some ways the right to blow your mind, to use that term, is part of this process of, in a sense, refining the subjectivity that is the very nature of liberal democracy. Yes. Yes. So the way that I, I put it, and it, it, it is very difficult to talk about spiritual things in uh, even in academia, and probably even, I'm not in a religious studies department yet, but I soon will be. Um, uh, the way that I write about it is I tend to say that the in the 1960s, uh, uh, the psychedelic movement performed a public sacrifice on the notion of the state. And uh, uh, use theological language, use a, a, a theorist like René Girard, who uh, has written quite a bit on sacrifice or violence and sacrifice. Um, in the 1970s, uh, post-structuralist culture invades uh, the U.S. academies, um, uh, and and that really shapes the curriculum of the late 1990s and, and even today. Um, but uh, which, in many ways, that I'm very invested in and in, um, all for. But in other ways, that have been sort of uh, dogmatically. Um, uh, uh, put in place for um, rather narrow um, uh, bureaucratic ends, I think. Um, the, the, the liberal, um, what has happened, and, that, and this is why, again, to come back to that metaphor of uh, that we're not doing public levitations of the Pentagon, there's something not that, that about today that is not enchanted in the way that it was in the 1960s. And yet we could look back to the 60s, not just for like the nostalgia of like, you know, Jimi Hendrix playing the national anthem or something at Woodstock, um, but to see where that enchantment came from. When I think about ISIS, when I think about um, uh, um, the Arab Spring, um, uh, I have a much longer um, political view, and I'm sure you do too, Carl, but I, uh, I, um, I know that there's a traditionalism movement in France, for example, that's really reacting to the separation of church and state in 1905. Um, where Catholic uh, um, theology was separated distinctly from from the state, and um, we th this shows up later later on in debates about um, um, hajib and stuff, which characterized a lot of citizen de citizen debates in France in um, the early 21st century. Um, I see a very um, disaffected uh, feeling among certain intellectuals with modernism, modernization, the sense that modernism didn't work, and a return to traditionalism. I see that idea spreading um, through what I, I guess we'll call, we could call now globalization to areas of the world that not that weren't modernized in the kind of industrialized sense that happened in Europe and the United States in the 19th century. So uh, there's a traditionalism brings with without a sense of history, right, <laughs> brings a kind of sense that uh, um, things have always been a certain way, a kind of perennialism uh, that was f for for a lot of thinkers like Aldous Huxley in his perennial philosophy, for example, wanted to speak to in the middle of the 20th century um, from a very particular point in history for them. Uh, but the way that those ideas get spread um, later on uh, um, don't have that kind of sense of history to them. 
and so and they play into very racist and ethnocentric notions that say like some, something really stupid like that Islam uh, uh, is somehow uh, uh, anti-modern, uh, intrinsically anti-modern, or that terrorists are just um, that they're trying to make uh, uh, us go back to the Middle Ages or something. I think that there's really a kind of hypermodernism at work. Um, well, well, yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, in, in fence, this is the paradox of fundamentalism, which has been pointed out, and actually uh, Derrida and Vadimo uh, first, uh, you know, brought this to our attention in their famous uh, Capri seminars in 1993 on the return of religion, that there, there is this kind of uh, what they call this autoimmunity that modern fundamentalism uh embodies where in a sense you're you're using technology extreme technological means uh to in a sense uh to anti to demodernize or to anti-modernize uh and of course to use you know the best and more most advanced sophisticated weaponry to create uh, a political system in this case a caliphate you know where they're calling the caliphate which you know really isn't a, a political order so much as it's a regime of terror uh but you, but you're doing it you're using political tropes uh to uh, advance what is essentially an anti-modernist uh, kind of uh, revolt uh and you're doing it on a massive scale using the name of religion and very select view of religion because i mean uh, oliver roy uh in his book yeah, I, I to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's talking. He calls this the uh, the separate where religion and culture part ways. Uh, you know, as long as religion and culture are intertwined, uh, you get you get this kind of thing. But what you're getting now uh, is re is uh, religious uh, extremism, religious violence that uh, that goes against uh, what we consider to be the normative liberal state. Uh, and we get a kind of decadent liberal secularism on the other side uh, that doesn't understand its own religious origins, as somebody like Mark Leela has pointed out. You know, and in, in some ways, you know, uh, and, and this really goes beyond the question of psychedelic culture, but I think psychedelic culture, you know, which was never really even in its beginnings, was never really a matter of people really trying to explore inner space. Uh, it was, uh, in, in, in some ways, a, you know, it was, uh, it was like it was like so much of the sexual revolution itself. It was uh, an effort to kind of transgress without any sense of, you know, or any you know, or any care, you know, what the consequences might be. In some ways, it was highly reactive. So it was a kind of uh, reacted, alienated secularism, a lot of it prompted by Vietnam, but also the pressures about modern regimented industri uh, industri late industrial America that had been building up, particularly in the baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, you know, the, pos the possibilities, the real critical thinking, which you see in a lot of the radical thinkers that came out of that period, particularly the French intellectual tradition. I mean, I think historians will say that the kind of crop of, of uh, innovative intellectuals that came out of France in the late 1960s is unprecedented uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, Western intellectual history. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, had to do with this, this sensibility, whether they actually used LSD or not. A lot of them did. Uh, but with this new, this new kind of transcendental sensibility. To go back to your original observation about today, and here's you know, my own view, which is I, I talk a lot about my new book. Uh, I don't think that transcendental sensibility is there at all today. Uh, I think, you know, the I think we do have this, we are in this phase of what I would call a kind of de decadent secularism. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. We've gone from the age of Bush to the age of Obama, you know, to an age of a kind of, uh, you know, neo-American traditionalist, uh, you know, religious-based self-satisfaction founded in the kind of political triumph for time of an evangelical establishment you know, to the sudden eclipse of, of the evangelicals and, you know, basically, 
this, this kind of almost obsessive purging of of everything you know about traditionalism that's going on right now, uh, and I don't see that as a healthy thing. You know, I see that as a as a kind of a, is a kind of obsessive thing because it doesn't really have a political, it doesn't really have a real political goal. It's not about emancipation. Uh, in in some ways, it's about it's it's uh, this it's this sense of well, you know, in sense we've transgressed all the boundaries, but we don't know where to go. Um, and you know, social media doesn't help because whenever there's an outrage on social media that anybody can post about, you know, we all get our dander up and we comment. And, you know, we can, you know, we can throw out, we can throw f bombs, and we feel better, and we keep going doing this as the world becomes more complex. Uh, at the same time, you know, you see the triumph of traditionalism uh, in the rest of the world that is using that as, in some ways, a pushback. Not so much against modernity, but against uh, the European colonial idea of modernity. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have colonial sort of gunboats, but we certainly have them with banks uh, in so much of the world today. And I think traditionalism is, is a way of sending a signal to the decadent West. It's like, you know, we're, you know, uh, you know, we're we've got to be taken seriously for who we are, not who you are. So, I mean, uh, in in some ways, I think. Uh, we're 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 in a time where we have a culture. We have great opportunities, like we did in the '60s, to mobilize around the new sensibilities that our new freedoms have given us. But in some ways, I don't think we we value these freedoms, you know, so much. You know, I mean, we've. I mean, it was, it's interesting. They did a poll about three years ago among young millennials, and they found the most overriding political. Um, uh, you know, issue was the legalization of pot. Well, now, you know, we've we've legalized pot in Colorado now for several years. We haven't in the rest, but when even the, the Texas legislature, as it did a few months ago, would seriously consider, you know, legalizing pot, you know, where, you know, we know where things are moving. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, to say, well, that's your priority. I mean, you, in some ways you're understanding you know, mind expansion, not as political expansion, but is in some ways something that is anti-politics. You know, it's about, you know, it's about self-satisfaction. It's, you know, it's about narcissism. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to the 60s. That in many ways why, you know, I mean, the real mourning in America in some ways was the, uh, you know, was 1965 with the passage of the civil rights movement and everything. It wasn't. It wasn't the election of Ronald Reagan, uh, but it was that that in that that notion of a new hope, you know, that that basically crumbled in the 1970s because, you know, it became all about you know, you know, self self indulgence, self satisfaction, and so forth. So you get an old radical uh, leftist like uh, Christopher Lash would write his book in, entitled "The uh, Culture of Narcissism" and. Uh, Jimmy Carter would use that book to say there's something politically wrong with America right now and he'd lose the election to Reagan primarily because, you know, he talked about malaise in America. People didn't want to hear about malaise. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I think that, you know, in, in, in some ways the whole notion of the ecstatic or the, of the spiritual has historically throughout America been used, you know, as a way of realizing the potentials of citizenship and emancipation. But it also, it's a two-edged sword. It also has the power and the potential for, in a sense, creating what is absolutely the worst of American culture, which is self-indulgent consumerism. Right. And Tocqueville no, himself noted that paradox. Yes. Yeah, and it's almost like, a, I mean, to, I'm going to use Charles Taylor's notions. of uh, uh, In his book, A Secular Age, he talks about a broad history of becoming buffered selves. Um, so kind of narrowed version of subjectivity as opposed to an earlier, and he's really talking about uh, before the Renaissance, a, a sense of a porous self like a sponge. But uh, what I feel like happened in the 1960s was there was a not a traditionalist necessarily turn to this, but there was the psychedelic movement opened up a kind of porousness to self. And yeah. we see... There's the potential for that now. I see a lot of creative writers dealing with it in interesting ways. Definitely 
uh, feminist writers like Lauren Berlant um, uh, and Cruel Optimism, who are kind of working with um, uh, um, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, um, notions of uh, rhizomic thinking. Um, I, I see those kind of like rethinking of, of subjectivity um, in, in interesting ways, even in the Wachowski brothers, or sorry, the Wachowskis, um, not brothers anymore, uh, their new series on, on the web. But you're right about the sense that uh, kind of crass culture um, tends to dampen a sense of the ecstatic. Some writers, like Michael Tosig, have written about the kind of magical aspects of consumer culture. And I'm really, really intrigued by that kind of thinking. Um, uh, in the book Beauty and the Beast from a few years ago, he's writing about uh, cos botched cosmetic surgery in South America, um, but he calls it cosmic surgery, <laughs> um, where, you know, you'll uh, uh, somebody with without many means will... will get a botched butt enlargement that dro droops down into their legs, um, for example, or um, uh, uh, drug lords who have uh, toilet paper with golden signias on each little patch of toilet paper that they wipe their asses with. So this sense of, of consumerism outdoing itself and becoming um, al almost a... a karmic type of force. I think that that's an interesting way to think about spirituality in the 21st century, but it's it's so out of touch for what one I feel like could want to do on an individual level. Like say I, say I feel a spiritual longing, like what, where do I go to do that? Like a lot of people go to yoga but it's been de-spiritualized. Right, it's 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 twenty four hour fitness. You know, you go, uh, you you go. It's or wellness. You know, it's it's something you kind of do for a variety of therapeutic benefits, but it has no life world uh, quality to it, and so forth. Well, let, I, let me throw out a, a thesis to you. I have that's just come to me in thinking about this. Uh, you know, because there's the whole question of what we call political spirituality which in many ways is the more interesting issue than the broader question of political theology. In some ways, even though I think political theology is a covering term for a lot of the kind of very creative theorizing that's going on right now, it's, it's also a somewhat limited term because it implies that, as is in the word theology, we already have a kind of spiritual base upon which we to reflect about politics, uh, and we don't. Uh, you know, uh, you know, my colleague at the University of Denver, Luis Leon, had published with University of California Press, a very interesting book on the life of, of Cesar Chavez. Mm -hmm. In fact, the uh, uh, interview with him is in one of these critical conversations. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, he, he talks about Chavez's political, uh, political spirituality. He get, gets the term from Foucault. Uh, I mean, you, one could do the same kind of study of a Martin Luther King. One, I th one could, I think, uh, you know, do it of, of a figure who was not politically successful, but who continues to be a very effective leader in his post-presidential phase, and that's Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, who's always kind of the, the one that, you know, <laughs> goes against the grain of whatever is considered the, you know, contemporary political wisdom. Uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of the great activists that we've sort of forgotten about, especially if you go back to things like the Catholic labor movement. You look at like a figure that's still very much uh, read today uh, among continental philosophers, uh, Simone Weil. Uh, mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a rich spirituality that all these radical political thinkers were drawing upon uh, in terms of a religious tradition. Uh, you know, whether a Jewish or Christian, but, you know, there, there are even certain kind of, you know, Islamic writers uh, uh, today, uh, like, uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm probably not getting, uh, probably getting out of my era, but I, uh, 
they're not they're not household words, but uh, uh, but uh, that, that you can also you can look at uh, today. You know, no matter no matter what you think of what's going on in uh, you know present day Iran, and I don't I. I don't have any much good to say about what's happening in present day Iran, but the whole Iranian revolution was in some ways a, a movement of political, uh, it, it was based on a political spirituality uh, for its time that, that moved the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course we know that political spirituality movements always become corrupt over time, which is certainly what's happened, you know, in, in countries like that. But it's what makes politics politics. And I think, you know, with this, whole trend toward this new secularism, which is all the rage right now. Uh, this, this, this kind of, as I say, this sort of uh, almost like this cultural revolution of basically burning down and shaming, you know, all the monuments from the past, uh, you know, have some kind of traditional cultural value like happened in China uh, in the 1960s, uh, you know, with the Gang of Four. I mean, that's really what's going on today a lot. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's a, and that's a kind of, it's a narcissistic catharsis of culture that doesn't, that's, that claims to be emancipatory, but in fact, it's the opposite. It's, uh, it's, it's not even fascistic. It's, 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 it's basically nihilism uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that Nietzsche meant it uh, in, uh, in a lot of respects, because it's, because it's, you know, ever since we had the new atheists who convinced an increasing segment of the intelligent population that religion is just a bunch of nonsense, you know, but the nonsense of religion, those particular values, the spiritual traditions, particularly the meditative traditions and the disciplines that come with those have been in some ways the very engines of political revolution throughout history. And only when, you know, uh, political leadership can begin to recover that sense of spiritual continuity and tradition. It's, uh, it's what, uh, uh, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Michael Walzer calls the revolution of the saints, the yes. term I use in my new book. You know, I mean, this, the saints are the real revolutionaries. Uh, and and, and we, we're not going to have political change until we can somehow recover that, real, profound, energizing, historically rich, uh, spiritual, political, theological core. Yes, yes, I, and I agree, and especially with the 1960s, the, the Catholic personalism, especially in the form of Peter Marin and Dorothy Day and the anti-nuclear movement, um, which, which precedes the 1960s by about five years and went once a um, Thomas Merton starts getting involved. There's a spirituality to that version of personalism. There's a reason why they thought of that as a third way between communism and capitalism, and that was entwined with their spiritualism, why they were separated at various different times from the more formalized Catholic Church in Rome. And, uh, I, um, and, and that it's a, a different kind of personalism than I see today and a writer like, who I have a lot of respect for Christian Smith, but his new book, What is a Person, the sociological writer, um, uh, uh, who, uh, who, who he very much does an equitable job of taking to task um, kind of extreme post-modern uh, theory as we know it from maybe the 70s or the 80s in academia, and taking good things about that and saying, look, and, and then the people who are kind of over theory and trying to bring something new. I don't agree with him in everything, but I still don't believe that that version of personalism is the same thing that was driving people like Simone Weil, like Dorothy Day, Peter Morin, um, uh, maybe less so Jacques Maritain, but... Yeah, well, I mean, the, those people, you know, lived in times which were rough times. We don't live in rough times. You know, there's, we don't, we have very little at stake uh, today. You know, I mean, we've, you know, yeah, I mean, if you're an academic, you may be an adjunct and can't get, you know, the kind of job you want. But, you know, the sense, I think spirituality and a sense of social struggle always go hand in hand with each other. 
and we've lost that sense of social struggle. I mean, the interesting thing is that it's, you know, it's the age of Obama where we think all of a sudden everything is wrong with the world, uh, you know, when in fact it was the utopian promise of, of progressive politics that, you know, uh, Obama wrote in on. Uh, and, and yes, there's there's been, you know, blockage to certain political programs, but a lot of these big programs have been realized, and yet there seems to be more, you know, political outrage and dissatisfaction than there ever was. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, that real politics, which is ultimately a spiritual politics, requires, you know, a sense of struggle and, and resistance. Uh, other, otherwise, it just becomes, uh, you know, narcissistic venting, which I think it is today. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's uh, you talk about personalism. Um, that I think that's an interesting way to revive politics. And I'll just throw out a term here for another conversation. Uh, kind of insurgent uh, revolutionary personalism, uh, you know, as opposed to a kind of idealistic longing like we've seen in the past. You know, might be the secret of politics. And, you know, I've got some of my own history where, you know, and since that goes back to the 60s, because I think that was what really triggered, you know, the, the upheavals of the 60s. It was, it was the, to use that, you know, phrase of a, you know, the, you know, title of a band, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, you know, the machine is a lot less obvious right now. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's... It's uh, the digitization of everything from finance to lives to, you know, the the the, mar the cookies that you know tell us what kind of advertising message do we get from Google and that kind of thing. You know, so we don't have that sense of rage. We rage against other things, and in some ways, we need to recover that vision of you know of personalistic integrity in politics, which is really interpersonalistic integrity. Yeah, and, and to come back to the psychedelic theme, I think, uh, and a different sort of angle, I, while I think that there's still potential for psychedelics, I also think that the psychedelic as a right, the psychedelic as pure therapy, or the, the, uh, uh, the psychedelic as, like, I'm doing something bad, I'm doing something against the law, which is, really comes after the early 70s, um, uh, but the, but that for people who grew up after the illegalization of LSD, um, that doing something cool or under the radar insulated a kind of citizenship that gave you a kind of moral authority over the state. Um, you weren't ever not American if you had tripped LSD, for example. You were almost more American for having done that sort of thing. Uh, um, now, um, I think that we need to be critical. I, I want to encourage all spiritual exploration, and at the same time I'm really suspicious of ayahuasca tourism, for example, because it's ritualized in, a, in, in, in a, such a conventional way. Um, there are ethical problems with indigenous communities and stuff too that, that we could talk about, but what is disturbing to me more so is the the ritualized avenue that somehow makes access to something that I think of as spirituality even more difficult. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we'll have this, we'll have this conversation later on. That sounds, that sounds great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Fascinating. We'll, we'll um, do another one of these, uh, you know, maybe uh, later on in the fall when, uh, you know, the whole political theology discussions get going. So, okay. All right. So let me.